Hi, thank you, Michael. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, thanks. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, my name is Neil Batra. I'm the president of the nonprofit organization Applied Epi and one of the co-founders of the Epi R Handbook Project, which some of you may have heard about. And I'd like to talk to you today at the R Medicine Conference about uh, R in the public health side of medicine, um, in the and and more specifically in the applied epidemiology uh, side of epidemiology. So uh, I'll be talking about some of the innovations that our group has been doing, the wide community that we've built over the last year and a half, um, some of the tools that are available to you for learning R and for using R. Um, and I think you'll appreciate and and I'm, I'd be excited to talk with many of you about where this can go in terms of getting R more widely accepted in this space. So I'll go ahead to my next slide. Um, this is the R Medicine Conference, but I think it's still worthwhile um, just describing in very crude terms uh, epidemiology. Uh, just the different spheres in epidemiology, because it, it actually has an impact on the work that we've done as applied epi. Um, and that is just to say that, generally speaking, we have academic epidemiology, where perhaps it could be said the, the primary objective is to advance the knowledge base. This work often involves complex mathematical modeling. And in this space, I would say R is pretty widely accepted and resources are available, many of which have been displayed at this conference. Um, now, the space where Applied Epi works is in the partner side of this, where it's about the practice of epidemiology to actually implement disease control. And in this in this space, um, the objective is usually operational insight for disease control. Um, this often takes place in emergency settings where time is short, uh, resources are short, uh, people are stressed, and um, you know producing a situation report is is crucial, and it has to be done fast or something like this. The analyses are mostly descriptive; they're usually very simple analysis, tables, plots, descriptive maps, simple dashboards, this kind of thing. But in this space. Um, our adoption has been hindered by a lack of training that's relatable to the kinds of people and their backgrounds that work in this side of epidemiology. Um, it's not widely adopted yet, although the, mom the momentum is there. And I'm speaking for, as, from a perspective of somebody who's been working in epidemiology for over 10 years, and I've been in this applied space the whole time. So I've worked um, for organizations like local county health departments in the United States um, with uh, WHO and Doctors Without Borders internationally. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the, the world I in inhabit. Um, so Applied Epi focuses on that latter part. It's the frontline public health that we really want to strengthen. And although what we do is not restricted to R, R is a large part of what we are doing right now. Um, so that's the tools that we're building. So we're talking about R packages, but largely the biggest tool we felt we've built is the Epi R handbook, which I'll be talking about later. Um, training that we think is relevant to field practice that really meets these field practitioners where they're at in terms of their comfort with coding and with the content and making that transition accelerated. Um, the support that's needed beyond a one-off training or beyond the tools, the, the need to build this ecosystem of support to really es escort people in their journey into maybe what might be first-time programming for many people. Um, and as they as they sort of explore the depths of the of the R community, um, the, the vastness of it. And then on top of all that, we want to leverage the transition of public health to R to take an opportunity and make the methods, the science behind public health and sort of interventional applied epidemiology, make, make that more robust, because I think that's that's a key part of epidemiology. It's not just about coding, it's also about all of the, the science and methods behind what we do. So who are we? Let me just take a minute and, and describe a picture of our group here. So at this point, we have about 170 people who are contributing to our, our various projects. Um, at this point, we're mostly uh, away from using volunteers and, and actually have paid consultants at this point. And they're scattered across the world in over 40 countries. Um, the thing that really defines us and sets us apart from, say, a group that's based in an academic university um, is that we are built of practitioners. So people, like I said, who are working at district or country or county level health agencies or NGOs. Um, and so it's that extensive frontline public health experience that we're bringing to the table. And that really 
uh, comes across in the training materials we build, um, whether it's the EPIR handbook or our courses or our tutorials. Um, so we really are a movement for EPIs and by EPIs. Um, the group consists of our experts. Some of the people on our team are building the cutting and cutting edge R packages, such as you know transmission chain packages, modeling packages, um, et cetera. But we're also made up of learners because that's really the vast majority of the public health audience we're trying to serve. Um, many people on our team are data science educators, and we have many languages represented. We've strengthened many partnerships over the past year. So whether it's the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, linked with WHO, um, ICERIC, uh, the US CDC, we have a very strong relationship with the field epidemiology training programs around the world, the FETPs, um, and TEFINET, which is a, a major funding source for those, and many others. And Doctors Without Borders has also been a strong supporter of our, of our program. And we can actually put some numbers to this, you know, uh, however crudely, that the need for our training in this sphere is very clear. Um, so we recently did a survey with TEFINET, that group I said that supports field epidemiologist training programs. And in the survey, um, low income field, ep field epidemiologists in low income countries overwhelmingly said they felt constrained by their current tools. Right. This is an astounding number and that these were primarily uh, Excel, SPSS, uh, Epi Info, either point and click tools are still broadly being used around the world in applied epidemiology and public health. 90% 90, 90 said that our training should be a high priority. So they recognize that R is the way for them, for their careers and to make their work more efficient and better. Um, but only 12% said that their agency had the sufficient capacity to actually train them in R. Um, so that's the problem. They recognize that it's the gold standard, they want it, um, but there's a, there's a training gap there and the impact can be huge. Now, I don't need to talk too much about why R is being adopted now in public health. It's, um, I mean, this audience knows it's, it's free. The advanced capabilities are incredible, especially visualizations. Those who are learning R are coming in at a time when it's easier to learn than ever with Tidyverse and RStudio. People like me who learned it 10 years ago, Wow, that was a, it was a different story. It was a little more difficult to pick up um, as a novice. Um, the fact that it's community driven and the collaboration benefits are huge. So a few examples in public health, the R markdown feature, as you know, is, is really the, a game changer for public health. For, for folks who are used to uh, editing Microsoft Word documents in a harried manner right during an outbreak, the idea of, in this case, for example, producing over 300 COVID situation reports in a day, um, and doing that every day uh, at the beginning of COVID-19 is um, was 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 so powerful, right? And this is why many jurisdictions are switching to R right now. Um, I was working in Haiti last September uh, during the earthquake response there, um, and I, I I actually met a Haitian epidemiologist there who, uh, much to my pleasure, said, "I've been using your epidemiologist R handbook for three months, teaching myself R, and I've." I've transformed my workflow from collecting the data and, well, not collecting, but you know, receiving the data, processing it, cleaning it, and producing reports that used to take me 80% of my week, over 30 hours a week, and he had turned that into 30 minutes or so, right? And, and I think all of us know how that happens with R, but for him, this was a dramatic change. It allowed him to think big picture about the health systems and ways to actually improve instead of always playing catch up and, and cleaning data in Excel. And he also felt that he trusted his analysis more. He trusted his analyses more because he said, I, I know when there's a mistake. I know when there's an error because R will tell me. Um, so I think the, the, the other thing I want to dwell on before moving into what we do is that, um, as you know, R is not just another tool coming in. It's a culture. And this is a culture shift for a, for a discipline that's used to working with SaaS and Stata corporate software. Uh, to do these kinds of analyses. And this is inherently democratizing, um, it's decentralizing innovation, and ultimately it's gonna em uh, empower uh, EPIs from the global south. And I think that really drives our organization. So what have we done? Um, this is a, a little diagram we've made that sort of pictures uh, all of the different pieces we're working on for R. There are other pieces we work in, are working on that do not have to do with R. Um, and uh, let's just walk through this piece by piece. So the first, item that really launched our organization was the Epidemiologist R Handbook. Now, this is a book down. Um, it was launched in May of 2021. And uh, I think within 24 hours, it had been viewed 11,000 times. Uh, so it really went way farther than we expected. Um, it's now been used by 230,000 people. It's coming in at about 1,400 hits a day. 
Um, and we're just really, really pleased with how many people this has helped. What, what we thought would originally help being, being help maybe you know a couple hundred friends, um, and it really just kind of took off. It's available online at the website on the slide, so fbrhandbook.com. But we know many people are also using it offline um, in settings with very poor co internet connectivity. Um, and I'll get to the, the purpose of that later. Um, it's 50 chapters in the book down. I think if you take the book and you print it out in Microsoft Word, it's over 1,200 pages long. So it's, it's quite a large resource, um, but it's written to be easy to read. It's got sample code um, basically for the tasks that uh, EPIs do every day, whether it's making certain visualizations, doing R markdown, grouping data, deduplicating data, um, and I think it's written in a very sort of uh, practical way for those of you who have at least a little bit of R experience. We now have translations going into 11 languages. Um, and this has really expanded our network all over the world. Um, the Vietnamese translation is, is, is up and live and the French is coming soon, as is the Turkish and many others. Um, this was built by a group of epidemiologists who essentially were volunteers. Um, and there were people, probably 120 people from around the world who all contributed into this book. And I think that's really special. And it's something that um, makes sense within the R community. Uh, and it's something that I think the R and open source spirit really fosters. So the EPIR handbook, um, many of you have used book downs before, so I won't, I'll go through these slides very quickly, but in case you haven't seen it, you have sample code, uh, you have narrative text, essentially uh, tutorials basically, um, and walking through the outputs. Some of the chapters in the book, these are little uh, graphics that are at the top of each chapter. So if you're transitioning from Excel or from SAS or from Stata, we have uh, content especially for you. All of the importing and exporting you could ever imagine, whether you're working with APIs or Google Sheets um, or little tips like code to, to automatically import the latest CSV file that arrives in a folder, right? Very, very crucial for those of us who are receiving data every day and we need to make that report every day. Um, and a little bit about the basics as well of R, like R projects and all of this. We're using here and, and Rio and these kind of things that many people are who still peruse the internet, they still don't uh, know about some of these more recent developments that make coding much easier. Um, cleaning data is the bread and butter of an EPI's work. Um, and so we really we focus on cleaning data, how to apply those core tidyverse functions uh, to those crucial things like working with dates, the, the intricacies of deduplicating um, and grouping data with strings and all of this. So this is things you'll also find in say the R for data science book, but I think the lens here is very much driven by the tasks that we know that applied epidemiologists are asked to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's the framing and that's the scenarios and that's the code that we give. Um, and so also plots, I mean, we're at, that's communication of information is what we do, right? And so whether it's GIS basics, um, some more analysis like survival analysis, or we have a very robust chapter on time series and outbreak detection. And we've been connecting with the, the group at CDC that does syndromic surveillance to, to revise this chapter even. And like I mentioned, epidemic modeling, um, how to handle missing data and all of these things. Um, tables, just presenting simple descriptive tables. Remember I said that's that's really what most of this is all about, but also epidemic curves, which as EPIs were very particular about how these are shown. Um, and, and so there's a lot of code in there about how to make them exactly right. Um, you know, diagrams, transmission chains for outbreaks or phylogenetic trees, they're all in here. They link to other resources as well, but the idea is it's enough to get you started if this is all you have. Reports, um, I think some some gems in here are the, the report factory package, which helps automatically categorize our markdowns that are produced on a regular basis. Our Git chapter we're quite proud about. And even this chapter 49, how, to, how do you troubleshoot using R on a workplace computer that deals with OneDrive or that deals with uh, other kinds of firewalls? So this kinds of thing, uh, we, we really wanted to get out there, get our experiences out there to the world. Um, some of the challenges that we had making this book, well, we did it in a pandemic and it turns out in a pandemic, epidemiologists don't have a lot of time. Um, so that was a challenge, but we did want to keep independence from major institutions. So we were an, an NGO, a uh, nonprofit, and that really made us more agile and fast to produce this. We had to think about our audience and say, is this really for a true R beginner? And the answer is no. The handbook, is, it assumes you have some basic experience with R. Um, and I'll get to how we address the, the, those novice, true novices later. We made a lot of editorial decisions. 
um, that we detailed in a chapter called Editorial Decisions um, about which, which packages we chose to, to highlight and how we decided to show different solutions to, for example, making an epi curve. Did we choose wrapper packages? Did we go with ggplot? Did we do both? Um, it was a massive book down, uh, and that was a challenge just to get it rendered, and is still a challenge with the translations today. So that's the EBR handbook. I encourage you to check it out. And like I said, there's a gap there, though. It's not for the novice. Um, and so that's why we built this tier of, of material. And there's two components to this. The first is our live course, our gold standard. Um, and I'll get to, I'll describe it in a moment. And the second is these free self-paced uh, Learn R tutorials that many of you have probably used before, something like them. The course itself is 35 hours long. Um, so it's, it's basically a week. Um, and we try and put as much of the, the really important R basics in there as possible, focusing on data cleaning, on uh, making plots and making reports, because that's really what most people want to learn how to do quickly. Um, it's all public health case studies. Uh, it's live coding demonstrations. Um, the, the, the feedback we've gotten in this course is, is fantastic and it's always being improved. And I won't dwell on it more than that, just to say, this is out here. If this is the course your organization is looking for, then uh, send us an email. Um, We've supported at this point a lot of health agencies in the, just in the last year, um, and we have we're running trainings essentially every day for the remainder of the year, um, and so I think that just speaks to the demand among the public health uh, space for this kind of thing. Um, our educational approach, um, again, it's about delivering the content that we know as frontline practitioners. We're very intentional about the vocabulary we use, right? Um, you know, things that can be very quickly alienating to someone who's never been in this computer science-y world. Um, even just using the word string, for example. Well, people might think of their shoelaces. So how do we, how do we introduce that language in a way that doesn't make them feel, uh, you know, less, lesser? Um, building that confidence to tinker tinkering, experimentation. That's built into the curriculum. I think that's really important. Um, and we actually spend the time to help them use R. We dedicate uh, up to an hour per person to help them troubleshoot their installations, their OneDrive, uh, sync problems, et cetera, which I think is much more important than putting them in a cloud environment that's very sterile, because we want them to actually be able to use R. We do have these five free tutorials online that cover much of the same content, because we know that our live courses won't reach everyone. Um, and those are accessible at our website, and it's just a login, a free login that you can use to, to get into those tutorials. Um, we do have some advanced courses and case studies. So these are advanced courses, uh, whether you're looking to do GIS, dashboards, um, you know, survey analysis, or learn statistical modeling in, the, in R. Um, these are also available, although quite frankly, we've been overwhelmed with the amount of uh, introductory courses that have been in demand. The idea with case studies is participants would ask, where do I go to get extra practice? And um, well, so we said, well, let's go work with all of the different health agencies we are affiliated with around the world and gather the free case studies and put them in one place. Um, so this is a work in progress, but we have several up there now, and I'm sure we'll be adding more in the next few months. Uh, we do make some packages, um, but really it's not our priority. Uh, we make the SITREP package, uh, which was originally made by a, a number of different partners. Um, and MSF is, 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 this is really for MSF, the Doctors Without Borders. But the R Markdown templates and some of the helper functions that are there um, are very applicable. So the original makers of that, Recon, uh, MSF, and then we've taken over the management and maintenance of this. Um, the support piece, I mentioned this. We all know that training is not adequate. It may be required, but it's not adequate. And we've addressed this in two pieces. One is the applied epi community. So this is a discourse forum, which is different than Discord. Um, but essentially, it's similar to what you would find in Stack Exchange. But the idea here is that it's much more friendly, much more welcoming of mistakes. Um, and it's really embracing the public health context behind questions and not just stripping it down to coding alone. Because um, quite frankly, many people, myself included, are intimidated to post on a, on a forum like Stack Exchange. Um, whether we've made our reproducible example exactly right uh, can be really scary, especially for people where this is all very new. Um, and so we have topic areas in here about R code, but also about epi methods, um, other software, math modeling, this kind of thing. Um, the community, you can post uh, a question, you can get answers within a day or two uh, from several people uh, around the world. The community builds it. Um, and again, you can read it for free or join the discussion with a, with a login. What we're piloting now is the extension of this. And the goal here is ambitious. The goal is that like we have 30, 40 instructors now around the world that are teaching classes, we also have a 
co a cadre of technicians who are going to man an R public health desk. So this is something we're piloting with Doctors Without Borders and with a number of these field epi training programs right now, and we hope to roll it out within a few months. Um, but this is the idea that um, agencies can subscribe and we'd have discounts for low income settings. And this is where you can call and get a uh, an answer, whether it's, oh, I can't figure out and oh, it's just the comma that you misplaced. Um, you know, or maybe it's, can you help me build my data pipeline because I'm responding to an Ebola outbreak and I've just learned R and I'm not really sure how to do this. So we've been working with WHO and talking about how we can support uh, those kinds of responses, which many people on our team have already supported, but this, this kind of help desk feature would be really helpful in, in those kinds of settings. Um, so that's something that's in the works. Um, we're piloting it, like I said, and uh, we hope to roll it out soon. So if anyone's interested in helping us build this or supporting it, um, you could have a massive impact if you help this, if you help us bring this into reality. So in the interest of time, I want to just bring some parting thoughts here. Um, firstly, public health is a discipline that in most of the world is relying on suboptimal technology. And I think we've all seen in the past two and a half years um, how problematic that is. Um, that a, a, a discipline that's been chronically underfunded and really is a part of the infrastructure of society for emergency response and for just general functioning, um, we need to make this an easy transition. The Moving from point and click to a scripted reproducible analysis is a huge step for people who are have not been in, in, in embedded in computers their entire life. And so I think we need to discuss how do we make our space as our users more friendly to people like this, to practitioners, and make sure that this transition like this is actually led by practitioners. Um, and mostly I see led by academic folk and led by, um, you know, and I think that's fine, but it needs, there needs to be a big seat at the table for the end users. Um, and I'll wrap up here in a moment. Um, the friendly communities of practice, I think is important. Um, relevant training materials. So, you know, most public health EPIs are not doing modeling. They're doing very basic descriptive EPI. Um, I think linkages between developers and front end users is extremely important uh, so that the tools made are actually useful. Um, and that I think it needs more funding uh, because ultimately we need our champions at these health agencies to be uh, institutional champions. And that leads to train the trainer campaigns that we're trying to do. And I wanted to just say that uh, the translation teams have been uh, for us a wonderful thing. Hundreds of people involved in translating our work. Um, and that's really expanded our global reach. And lastly, our website, if you're interested in applying to be an instructor or some kind of technical contributor otherwise, uh, we do have an open call for that. Um, here's our email address, our website, and the various Twitters and things like that. Um, and I will leave it with that. So Michael, over to you. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, we have, we do have a little bit of time. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, there, there was one question, um, or at least one question. All right, so um, there's a question. Do you teach data collection best practices in software like uh, RedCap, for example? So the quick answer is not yet. Um, we, we what we're building out our R curriculum right now, but as I mentioned, our organization we called it Applied Epi because, like it or not, someday in the future R might not be the tool of choice anymore. Um, and so teaching all everything around it is important to us. Everything from uh, basic Epi methods, how to do surveys, how to do sampling, how to uh, you know. What, even things like leadership in emergencies and how uh, field epidemiology works in practice, setting up surveillance systems, and that will involve data collection practices. Um, and so those are curricula that we are right now working on. We're actually working on a companion manual to the EPI-R handbook right now that will be focused on EPI methods and really a, a practical, um, implementable, you know, down to earth manual of epi methods as applied in mostly low income settings and tightly linked to the R handbook. Um, so we're calling it tentatively the epi methods manual. But the idea is that we're, we already have many partners who are interested in contributing to this. Um, and we're going to start writing it in the same way we did the epi R handbook. And I hope you'll see it sometime next year.
but I think that also gets to this collection about a uh, question about data collection. Sure. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. I see a question from Peter about, do you have companion learn our apps for the chapters? Um, I would say we, we have learn our tutorials. So those are the five tutorials available on our website, appliedepi.org slash tutorial. They don't exactly correspond with the handbook chapters because, well, there are 50 handbook chapters and only five tutorials. So that tells you something right there. Um, but uh, what we are looking at doing as we revise the handbook this fall with an update is making it much more interactive so you can sort of jump into a learn our environment and practice the coding with the data sets that you see in the tutorial uh, making that much easier to do um, so that's on the way thanks for the question let's see another question about data collection best practices um, Let's see, is REDCap often available? I would say yes. Yeah, a lot of people do use REDCap uh, who we work with. And I, there was another question in the chat. Do you think R should be taught in medical school? Lawrence, um, well, having never gone to medical school, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that. Um, you know, I studied epidemiology, but I'm not a medical doctor. Um, you know, I think, um, yes, I think it probably should, but I'm, I'm definitely not the most qualified person. And I think the thing what we teach is the, the application to public health disease control. And there are many physicians who end up in leadership positions in public health disease control. Now, whether or not they end up doing the coding themselves, it's probably important that they have an understanding of what a tool like R can do. Um, and I think that's so that it alone would be useful. Maybe it's not an intensive course, but maybe it's an exposure so they can understand how scripted languages like R work and what they can do in public health and what they can't do. Um, great. I'm seeing from Beth that many residents are coming in knowing R. That's fantastic. I think the, the, the critical piece there, though, is if they're going to go work in public health, they shouldn't have only received training in R for academic modeling and research and that's missed in so many uh, uh, academic curricula is the the data cleaning that you that you don't get because you're given a very standardized uh, data set to work on which is very understandable in an undergraduate class or even a master's class but when they step into their first job in a public health department whoa that data is not going to be so clean um, and they need to know how to do that and so that's why i think we find so many people looking at the fbr handbook um, is, is that's one reason uh, thanks joe uh, wonderful to hear about that call for proposals. 